Welcome to the Equestrian Mindset Academy podcast, an equestrian performance podcast where we will deep dive into the mindset and management challenges of ourselves and of our peers. Our discussions will allow you to learn from experts, encourage you to set audacious goals, overcome challenges, and develop actionable plans. Ready? Let's do this. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. I hope you're all doing well, particularly in the lead up to Christmas, which is very exciting. I hope you're actually taking some time to rest and that your horses are having fun and time off in the paddocks. So today we have another guest episode. We have Isabeau Solis on. Isabeau is a professional barn manager, an instructor, a trainer, and she has been around horses for nearly all of her life. So I think we have a lot that we can learn from her and from her interactions in the equestrian industry in particular. Most of our conversation today is focused around the ethics and satisfaction that we can gain from being in the equestrian industry. And we all know that it can be really challenging at times and that we see things that sometimes we don't agree with um, and sometimes we don't quite know how to deal with. So Isabeau has a really interesting perspective from someone who's been in the industry again nearly her whole life. What I personally loved about Isabeau is her attitude towards training, so how she remains in a figuring out state versus the pressure to just be at the end or to have arrived at the end goal. And she really gets that satisfaction out of training and out of just being with the animals, no matter what discipline she's working in and no matter what barn she's working in. And I hope you do get that from this discussion. I also really loved her perspective on other people's opinions and the influence that it can have on your horse journey and how she manages those difficult conversations and her perspective around that. This episode also links really well back to our discussion about what's in your control and what isn't in your control that we had a couple of episodes ago. And the sentence that really stuck out for me with Isabeau is where she said, it isn't my responsibility to make you do what I think is right, but she does attempt to set up the situation in order to assist. And I think a lot of us see around adjustment centers or barns things that we wish we could change, but we don't necessarily have the power to change. So I think this is a really interesting conversation and really excellent for us to learn. But more than anything, what I want to draw your attention to is that this is a really great opportunity for us to learn from someone who has an overwhelming passion in life, where that passion gets them out of bed every single day and has driven their decisions in terms of what they do or don't do and how they spend their time in their life. So Isabeau couldn't be a more perfect example of that. And it's just such a wonderful opportunity for you to hear from someone who's really pursuing what they want to pursue in their life and really finds the joy and the satisfaction in it. So I really hope that you love this episode as much as I loved speaking to Isabeau and have a wonderful Christmas and a wonderful New Year's again. And I will talk to you soon. All right, well, welcome everyone back to the podcast and welcome Isabeau onto the podcast today. Thanks. I am so excited to be here. A little terrified, but very excited. Beautiful. So Isabeau, why don't we start by you just telling us a little bit about you? Oh, let's see. I'm 51 now and I've been a professional in the industry. I first started teaching and barn managing when I was 16. Um, I was in 4-H from before the age of 10, which uh, I don't know if you have that in Australia, but it is um, an agricultural outreach program that links the United States university system with local, it used to be mostly rural communities. The original idea being everyone that was in any way involved with food production could be connected with the researchers in universities and universities could help all the local, all the rural communities take care of their animals and raise their crops and do that kind of thing. So it was a very intentional networking of rural producers and people in universities. And they had a strong component of educating young people. They wanted to teach you how to take care of your horses, how to take care of your pig, guinea pigs. So I came up in that as a young kid. And then from there on afterwards, pretty much just worked my way through the industry, doing a lot of different things. So does that mean you came from a horsey family or was it just the start in school that you got into it? Yeah, no, I didn't come from a horsey family. There just happened to be some horsey people in my neighborhood. Uh, actually, a lady, the first 4-H leader that I had, she... Um, 
illegally kept a horse in her backyard. <laughs> and when the cops came to give her tickets, one of the things they did was to hook her up with the local 4-H uh, leaders and help and help to hook her up with people who could help her to take better care of her horse, aside from keeping it in her backyard. And the neighborhood kids, of course, took notice of the horse in her backyard. So when she got into the 4-H program, the rest of us just kind of we globbed onto her whether she wanted us to or not. <laughs> and that's how we got rolling. And that would have been, you know, in the late seventies, it was a time when it was still common. You know, we worked for our riding. We would be dropped off. The school bus even at the beginning would let us off at the farm and kids would work in the afternoons, uh, take care of the horses and then get to ride and then get picked up by our parents later. That was still allowed at that point in time. Uh, I don't think people are doing that so much now, but then you could, you know, at a local stable, and there are still places where you can do this now, where they'll have kids, you know, come up stalls, do basic stuff, clean tack, and have them work off uh, lessons. That's, that's how I got into it. Yeah. My parents used to drop me there on a Saturday morning, and I used to muck out all of the yards and all of the stables and, you know, for, for 30 minutes, 40 minutes on the back of a horse. And I would spend yep. hours, hours doing that. Yep, you would. I, um, I've actually been thinking about, there's a few young girls that live on farms down the road from me. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about offering them a similar, a similar deal. <laughs> I'd, be I'd be wonderful. Get back to me. It'd be interesting to know whether they would take you up on, on, on it. Yeah, yeah. I'll let you know. So, so from that introduction into horses... Where did you go next with your horse education? Well, I made an attempt to go to a horsey college and I got a big wake up call there. Um, uh, that's where I learned. I went into the horse college and um, there was basically two groups of students. There was the kids who came in who had already been showing. They either had parents who were trainers or they somehow had access. And they often brought their show horses with them and they kept their horses in one barn. And the rest of us who did not come from that background, we groomed for them. <laughs> and, and that was, I don't know why I presumed things would be on an equal footing, but within a few months, I realized that that was the way it was. You know, the university promoted its program with competitive success and it imported those students, you know, it brought in people who already were competing and already were succeeding, turned them right back around, sent them out to shows. And those of us who had not come from that background, we were just expected to go and groom for them. And I was not foolish enough to borrow college money to go do that. I was like, well, this is a little silly. <laughs> so yes, I did. I only lasted a year in that program. I went off to another university, which wasn't horse focused. But I did manage once again to work off ride time at the equestrian center. And when I left college with a lot of debt and a not very useful bachelor's degree in English literature, I went right back to horses. You know, I just went, went right back to managing barns and riding, taught a summer camp right after college and then got a barn managing job for a private family that had reining horses and just kept rolling along, basically. <laughs> nice. And at that point, you didn't have your own horse, did you? Were you riding others? I did, not, I did not have my own horse. I always worked to ride other people's horses. You know, uh, people are very often, well, they're usually, they're, you, can, you can usually find some folks who either, if you're earnest and enthusiastic and, you know, you've got good grades and you seem like an honest kid, they would take pity on you and let you work off some ride time. Or you get some people who just have, it was not uncommon a, a few times, we had people who used to have a big show farm and they had a farm full of 40 or 50 almost completely neglected horses. And these people maybe aged out of showing and they didn't do much with the horses in it anymore. And other people within the community recognized that there was somebody over there who had 50 or 60 horses wandering around that were doing nothing. And so they would pull some kids from the 4-H program or they knew this kid who worked at the feed, feed store and try to hook them up to go do something with some of this person's uh, horses, you know, try to get some of them broken, some of them sold, some of them were already broke. 
Um, but yeah, people in the community, if they knew somebody who had a bunch of horses that were possibly sitting around and doing nothing, they might, you know, if they had a chance to point a young person in that direction, they would, you know, to see if they could help this person who had the 60 horses <laughs> that they weren't due to doing anything with, help that person, help the horses, get the kids some, some ride time. It's very on and off type stuff. Probably not the safest thing in the world, but... <laughs> Yes, that's um, it's so similar in ways to my story, where uh, I would find myself on all sorts of off the track thoroughbreds or people's horses that were semi retired out in the paddock that mm -hmm. hadn't been touched in 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 years. Uh, so, yep. but in a way, it's it's a really lovely way of learning about horses because my guess is then that you experienced multiple disciplines. You weren't just pigeonholed into the one discipline. I experienced multiple disciplines, but more than that, I experienced the ability to work with horses my own one little step at a time, as opposed to being in somebody else's guided program. So I could try this, try that, maybe fall off, maybe scare myself, learn why you don't do this. <laughs> um, but to be able to take things at your own pace, um, and this is very much the way we're supposed to learn, you know, we are by experimenting on our own. And I didn't know at the time that I was doing that exactly had, had a lot of unsupervised time with horses <laughs> to experiment and try things. And I learned some things the hard way. But um, it was very valuable to be able to realize that I could make progress or I could be very happy with horses and have a good time with horses. Just every day, if I go to the barn and I figure out a little better how to do something and I, you know, get something sorted out a bit, a bit better. And, you know, one of our topics to discuss was satisfaction and the fact that I actually like that a lot better than competing, better than a lot of other, the way programs are structured to get people out competing and doing stuff. And I actually enjoy that a lot. I didn't quite realize that at the time that that was what was going on, but that is how it worked out. I think it's such a beautiful re reflection of that time. Do you think, yeah. do you think back then, um, the past you, that you were enjoying it and feeling that satisfaction, or do you think that you would you would wish that you were in a system, learning someone's system with a trainer, or what do you think you were feeling at that time? Yeah, no, no. At that time, I was very much just happy. I like to play with the horses. I mean, I knew I was not particularly athletic. You know, there are the people who are super athletic. I'm definitely way more love horses than I am naturally athletic to ride. So to be able to take things in my own pace, yes, I enjoyed that lots. <laughs> and, you know, from time to time, somebody who was who did ride much better than me, just naturally, whether they'd been in a program or, or not, would come to work at the same barn or come to ride the same horses. And it was pretty clear I could not ride as well as they could. <laughs> and I was never going to be in those programs or, 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 or anything. So yeah, no, I didn't really have, didn't have much of a desire to be in them. Technology was different at that time. There was no internet or anything. Um, no, I would have been more influenced by the typical what my friends and I call black stallion poisoning because yeah the black stallion movies literally came out at that time I mean I forget when the first movie came out but I think it was the late 1970s so I would have been prime young age to have been strongly imprinted with that whole story yeah I love that I love that and I think this is it's such an interesting way of looking at it because I think me back then um and this was just as the internet was coming in my time, but I, I was like you, I wasn't necessarily the most talented, but I certainly had a love of the animals. And yeah, I was in this big dressage barn and I was surrounded oh. by these kids who were being bought Grand Prix schoolmasters. And Whoa. just like, for me, it was this sense of like, well, I don't want to figure it out. I just want to go from A to Z. <laughs> I just want to, <laughs> I want to be at the end. So, so for me, I think it was a really different sense of like urgency and, 
um yeah i think that can be a personality trait as well though like perhaps this is yeah. the difference between us is that figuring out state versus that like pressure to be at the end for sure no that's and i figured out later on when i years later i worked with some different people that yeah that there was definitely a big difference in yes the way what people got out of the horses and the satisfaction and it could be a big problem for people if they really just wanted to get from a to z and that if they didn't really enjoy the day-to-day -day steps that that could be a really hard thing for them to overcome. Like their desire to want to have arrived is actually very common. And a lot of, a lot of people don't enjoy the in-between steps, which was news to me. Like I, <laughs> it was news to me that some people really just wanted to get to the finish line and to the f fun part. And I completely did not think that way. I had a friend in my 20s who told me something that shocked me. She was going to go to Europe and be a working student at a German barn. And she said, if I go there and they tell me I don't have what it takes, I'm just going to go do something else. And I was completely shocked when she said that. I was like, well, why would I care what their opinion is? <laughs> so, so they go to the Olympics, so whatever. But I would never let the opinion of someone like that influence whether I think I'm going to do stuff with horses. And I didn't, you know, when she said that, I was like so totally shocked that she would let someone else make that decision for her. I was like, that's, you know, I, and I, I thought so differently. And then I was like, oh, some people think like that. Okay. It was very uh, eye opening. Yes. Yeah. I love that story because I really resonate with your friend there in the story <laughs> yeah, in that that would have been me and my response yeah um and it, it's really taken me a lot of mindset work to get to that point mm -hmm. where you are where i say well why would that influence me and my love of horses and how i work with horses so i love yes. that i love that you're bringing this perspective to the podcast this is so important so so you said there you went on into your kind of first barn manager role mm -hmm. and then that was in the reigning facility you said yep tell us how you found the reigning world um so the people i worked for were really nice and that's you know we were talking about ethics and job satisfaction so i mean that was that was interesting you know i was coming from mostly in the united states a lot of people start out in the hunter seat at quotation, which is the George Morris system of forward seat riding, which is what a lot of lesson barns do. So I did not have a lot of Western background. So I thought it was interesting and neat. And they worked with a kind of a famous person and they owned a kind of a famous horse. And they had a very different, I mean, their culture about showing they're very social. They all get together after the horse shows and in the evening, everybody gets a camper out and they cook food and they're very friendly and they really pride themselves in the fact that like you can go wander around the encampments and go talk to the most famous people in the world and they'll be more than happy to talk to you you know and they have a huge pride in that um and that's one of the big things that they really like about their sport um and the way they train the horse you know just recently in the united states they how to change your rules they're going to allow if you there's a certain sedative that you can give your horse within 30 minutes of going into the show pen that um they are people have been doing this i don't know how it is in your country but in the united states just people drug horses at every level <laughs> at every level almost every horse on all these competitions go into the ring with something people do all kinds of things so it's seen as preferable to instead of because one of the reasons i had a little bit of a problem with the fei was you know for a lot and it's not just for that particular sport but in some of these sports they will prep horses in the hunter jumper world they will lunge them for hour one hour two hours three hours in some of the western sports they will lope them out for one two three four hours you know, and people have cameras now and people watch these things. <laughs> so the sports, you know, and if you've probably seen that, even at the Olympics, they cover the warm up arenas now. Like you're not allowed to watch the warm ups. So in the horse business, 
I mean, we have we have problems <laughs> when our professionals, our top level riders are doing things that we can't let other people see. And they're doing the same things happen even at the littlest, most local show, you know, people's money and egos and reputation are online just the same way. So it happens from top to bottom. But, you know, I ran into those kinds of problems. The people were really nice. And some of the stuff they did with the horses was like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, and I had actually, when I was in high school, uh, ridden walking horses at one point in time. Some of the horses I got access to, and like, these were show walkers up on huge stacks, big. I don't know. Are you familiar with those horses at yes, all? Yes, yes, okay. I am. So, I mean, I never, I was just grateful to have horses to ride, you know, and they let me ride a big black stallion. <laughs> So who it took me 40 minutes to get on to because he wouldn't stand at the mounting block. <laughs> but I didn't care. I was a teenage girl, I was like 15 at that time. And I got to ride horses. And, you know, that was what I wanted. So, you know, I wasn't at that point up to where I could make any kind of judgment about what was going on. Um, but yeah, the older I got and the more things go, the more I start to get this stuff figured, figured out. Did you read the book, The Secret Race? No. Aha. The Secret Race is by one of Martin's friends, um, a guy who was a Tour de France rider. Mm -hmm. And his experience competing at the top of the sport, and the book is basically about, you know, when you get to the top of the sport, you have a choice. You can either do things the way they should be done, or you can do what everybody else does to get to the top. He's like, you know, you can either not quite get to the top or you can do what everyone at the top is doing. And he says, you know, in our culture, there's no excuse for not winning. Like if you don't win, it's because you didn't work hard enough. So you either have to work your whole life for this and get very close to the top and admit that you can't do it. Or you get up to where you're knocking on, on that door and you're either then going to start playing by the rules that everyone else does. That's a really good book if you haven't read that. And that covers all sports. It's about bicycle racing, but it pretty much applies to every sport. We've got horses included about, you know, the stuff that people do when they want to win or they have to sell. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, and that's some of the stuff I ran into with the reining horses. <laughs> Yes, I will. I will make sure I link that book in the show notes so that everyone yes. can find a copy of it because that sounds awesome. Just it's a good, yep, nice. Just then, when you were talking about that walking horse in particular, I had a flashback to yes. when I was a teenage girl and um, the first dressage horses I was allowed to ride. I always rode with uh, draw reins, and those are yes for anyone listening. Those are the reins that go from the girth through the bit to your hands and so um but that's how I was taught and for me it was the norm and and same thing I didn't think much about it because that's what everyone around me was doing that's what my instructors told me we would do and I was just so glad to be on a big dressage horse and yeah you were you sure were yeah and so from you and your journey then when do you think the point was that you you started to think there might be an issue or you might not agree with some of these things that you were seeing? Um, you know, so that's, that's just been a continual thing. It isn't a question about at the end about, I mean, in this day and age, there are, you know, people on one end of the animal rights spectrum who thinks we shouldn't even keep horses. So I have to keep in mind, no matter how much I may decide that I don't like what these people do or what that people do, there's plenty of people out there who don't like what I do. There are people who think we shouldn't ride horses. We yeah. shouldn't keep horses. So um, uh, not, not, we all have somebody out there who's going to think that what we're doing is wrong. So for me, it's mostly a, you know, if, I, if I'm dealing with a person or a situation and, you know, we're really having a problem getting together on the same page, you know, how much of a problem is this? You know, the, the problems I run into are uh, people keeping, uh, now you get you keep horses alive longer and longer and you run into people who keep horses alive and they, sometimes these animals are walking mummies. You know, the, you get really old horses and you walk into the barn and I'm just like, 
oh my God, why are they keeping this thing alive? Um, and that could just be your friends, your nice friend that you know that you talk to at work who tells you she's still got her old pony and one day you go out to visit her old pony. And yes, it's a still alive, but should it be? <laughs> um, you know, we run into these things all the time. So it's more a question of, you know, so what's my relationship with this person and what am I going to say? And, you know, rarely is there a circumstance where you're really going to interfere with what someone else is doing, you know? Uh, so recently we had in New York City, and unfortunately we have a lot of, pro I'm a big supporter of the carriage drivers in the cities and the vast majority of the time their horses are well cared for. And just last week, they had a circumstance where that was not the case. There was a guy who was a new driver and the horse collapsed on the street and it doesn't look good. The horse has EPM, the horse is older, the guy didn't, doesn't really have that much experience. I don't know why he's driving a carriage, <laughs> um, but the animal rights people just love it. You know, most of the time, a lot of the noise they make isn't really justified. This time, unfortunately, it does not look good. Um, so yeah, like what's my involvement? I mean, say your coworker takes you to see your old pony and it's like, you look at the pony and you're just, you know, what do you say? I mean, are you gonna interfere with that person? Not really, you know, are they bringing you there? It gets complicated quick, you know, are they bringing you there? Cause they really are looking for somebody to tell them that like, you know, do they wanna show you their own pony? Or are they looking for somebody to suggest to them it's time to put their pony down? Um, yeah, it gets, I find it gets complicated, complicated, quickly and that's one of the reasons why I have to think about it in advance more and more as a as a professional in the industry mm -hmm. how do you go about having those types of discussions those difficult conversations with with your employers or with your co-workers or colleagues is that a thing that happens in the industry people are responsible and they're going to make their own choices. You know, one of the most common problems I run into, I ran into last year and I'm currently about to run into it right now is people with horses who are really sensitive to grass and really can't be out in the fields and the owners really don't want them in stalls. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, if the owner wants to make the decision to put their horse out on grass when they really shouldn't, you know, then they have to accept the consequences of that and not attempt to blame me and also, you know, not attempt to foist the care responsibilities on me. So more and more, I'm, yes, developing the, the more skills to say, you know, it isn't my responsibility to make you do what I think is right. It's just my responsibility to set up the situation so that, you know, if you decide to do what you want to do against my advice, the consequences are on you. Uh, you know, and I can't guarantee that it's going to go one way or another. There are plenty of 400 pound overweight, obese horses living out with grass up to their eyeballs who never get sick. You know, that happens all the time. So I can't guarantee that, you know, somebody's horse is going to founder or refounder or something is going to go wrong. I can only set it up so that, you know, if they do what they want to do, but they take the consequences of that and not that they come back and try to blame me for it. And what I really like there is you said that um, they have to do what they think is right. So same yeah. for you and me, your response to a situation will be completely different to what my response to a situation is. And that doesn't yeah. mean we won't be able to get along or come to a compromise, but mm -hmm. it does then start to mean that perhaps the definitions of some of these words, like, satisfaction is an easier one mm -hmm. ethics yeah. even is that maybe yeah. is that maybe defined within ourselves then yeah yeah i mean it is i mean where it gets to be tricky is when there's some presumption that that we have you know the the industry as a whole has some kind of obligation to enforce standards you know like with the drug testing and with the carriage drivers you know if one of them has a bad day, they're all going to get painted with a bad brush. So it's hard to navigate between, you know, what we do with ourselves and then versus how our whole industry is looked on from the outside. Um, you know, we had a, 
I was watching the World Equestrian Games Endurance. I think they had it down in Tryon the last time. And they wound up canceling the event. They, first it was delayed, then they accidentally sent the riders in the wrong direction on course. They called them back. By that point in time, it had rained again. It was so hot and the ground was so deep that they just canceled the race. A bunch of the competitors got very upset with this, but the organizers can't take a risk of having, you know, if they think they're in a situation where they've got a bunch of really enthusiastic competitors, they can't have one or two horses dying on course in the heat, you know? So the people at different levels of, depending upon what organization you're in or what group you're, you're in, that, that's where it gets tricky because we, none of us, especially now that there's cameras around and everywhere, um, it's, it's hard for us to say that what we do has no impact on anybody except us. You know, that gets increasingly trickier over time. Yeah, I agree. So I think my understanding there is that actually what we've got is this like baseline or the standards for the industry. And then yeah. past that, really, it's up to each individual to work out what they are comfortable yeah. doing and what they're not. Like, um, yeah. for instance, I have friends near me who are not comfortable shoeing their horses like full stop, mm -hmm. they won't tap a, a nail into their horse's hoof. And that's, yeah. that's their choice. And they are allowed to yes. do that for their horse. But like you said before, if their horse was unable to walk with hooves that were growing and curling a back around on themselves, at that point, yes. people might call the vet or call the pound here, whoever, and, and there might be yeah. consequences to meet that baseline. But past that baseline, yeah. it's your choice. Which I think is, yeah. I think that's so interesting because it means that you, as a professional, you are somewhat responsible for finding a place to work that that matches you or your values. I mean, yeah, I mean, there is, there is, there is definitely a point beyond which you know I'm not willing to, you know, if your horse, if if you have a certain care plan, you know. Uh, maybe you think college horses should be walked or should be not walked. Maybe you think they should be walked and maybe your horse does not want to walk. I'm only going to be willing to push that horse so much. I'm not going to be willing to beat a sick colicky horse to walk like beyond a certain point, you know, I'm going to be willing to help the horse walk a little bit if that's what you want. But you know, there's a point at which I'm not, I, I don't want to participate in this anymore. And I mean, I find this riding instructors have this problem. Um, you know, increasingly they're brought riders who don't want to ride, kids who don't want to ride, their parents want them to ride. And the instructors are like, is this, I mean, I won't teach anyone who doesn't want to ride. But a lot of parents will get very angry if you won't take their kid and give them all. Let their take bringing you their kid because they want you to force their kid to ride. And that kind of stuff increasingly gets to be a problem. Um, you know, it, it uh, pe yeah, people's different opinions about what is your job as a riding instructor. Um, and some parents really believe your job is to force their kid to ride whether they want to ride or not. <laughs> Yeah. So you have to decide whether that's within your definitions of what you do as a riding instructor, because some people are really going to say that that is your job and you're going to have to say, no, that's not the job that I do. Mm. Does that link back to the satisfaction discussion as well? Yeah. You know, the satisfaction is really important um, in, in terms of, and I didn't, um, you know, some people really like the competition more than they like the horses. And, you know, if you've ever worked at, at these top level barns, I don't know how it is where you are, but in the United States, a lot of them are always desperate for help because the help does not last long. So a lot of people, if they've been in the industry, they worked for a lot of people at the top, most top level barns. And a lot of those people, um, they go through horses like crazy. You know, their top level horses last maybe a few years, but they've always got new ones in because they do the sport for as long as the horses last. And then the horses, they either get sold, their mares, they get bred, they get sold, they get put out in pasture and they get 
nuance, you know, and like, that's it. And that's what their thing is. And if you know these people for 10 or 20 years with that, within that time period, they will have gone through 20, 30, 50, 100 horses. And maybe that's what they like. They like competing. They like, they want to see if they can find a horse that's going to go do the dirt, the derby, or they won't find a horse. And for other people, that's just not what they enjoy about the horses at all. Mm. So you've been on kind of on all the sides. You've been on the horse ownership side. You've been on oh, yeah. an instructor, a barn manager. Yeah. How do we, how do we find a space then that we feel aligns with us or where we feel where we feel we agree with the ethics where we feel satisfied where we feel we fit in or that these are our people yeah i mean for me i'm at the age of 51 i mean i find so much online there are so many communities online on so many disciplines um and there's a lot more, I mean, a lot of ways, there's a lot more access to horses. All the, the rescue organizations now, in the United States, rescue has almost become a whole business model. Um, people are, it's basically a training barn because people are bringing in horses. They are retraining them. Sometimes they even go so far as to take them to horse shows to make them more adoptable out. Um, and then adopting them out or setting them out for a rehoming fee. Um, but there are a lot of options to go out and find your exact community. There's people who do clicker training, who do mixed positive and negative reinforcement training, all of the different breeds. And so much education is available online now. I mean, I, I wonder how many hours of horse training there are on, on YouTube. I mean, there's so much education that you could get where you could go find the community of people who do things in a way that you would like to explore them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would point most people to try to go on, on online and try to find the Facebook groups or I'm only on Facebook group, but I know there's tons of other horse boards where they, in all different kinds of uh, disciplines where they talk about pretty much everything. Um, the halter horse community is crazy online. People love, love their halter horses and they love to dress them up and they love to groom them. And that's actually a really huge community. I don't find showing horses on the line to be all that much fun, but there's a large, huge community of people who love it. Absolutely. So I totally agree with the online piece. And I mean, that's how we found each other in an online community. So how do you then balance that back with the, the physical surroundings that you're in at like your barn or um, wherever you're keeping your horse? Because I know sometimes some people have felt like, let's say they're um, stabling at a big dressage barn they they're sometimes even a bit nervous to just use the arena and do groundwork in the arena because for sure doing it. yeah 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 no and i mean for me the answer has been you've got to be willing to it's easy for me to say because i'm single and i don't have kids and i don't own a house um but i've had to move barns several times the gelding that i have now where I was living when I got him, I didn't think about the fact that it would be very hard to find a boarding situation for him because he was a huge baby warm blood and nobody in that area has those horses. And I had him at five different barns in the first year that I had him. Um, not you know, even, you know, not even for anything particularly terrible, but you know, and sometimes people just didn't have the time to take care of the horses. Sometimes my horse didn't get along with horses in the fields. Um, I mean, yeah, I wound up having to move him a lot. So there can definitely be a lot of, um, uh, you may have to put in a lot of years and a lot of hours. Um, you know, there are some things in horsemanship that you, you can learn a lot on, online, but some stuff you cannot shortcut you got to put in the time in the barn and maybe be willing to wait a year or a few years <laughs> until you get the right situation and continually trying situations and be willing to go back i mean 
mostly I've just been willing to go back again and again and again and try again and again and again. You know, horsemanship is, I'm really grateful to all the education that they have online now because when I think back to like the, um, the VHS sets, the John Lyons VHS sets that were coming out in the 90s and how quickly that's developed to really substantial solid information now. Now the positive and negative reinforcement people are really getting together and really making some useful stuff. Mm. Um, and it's really available to people, but there's still, uh, there is a lot of year, you, I mean, you, you really, the, if, if you're really into horses at the end of the day, you will have to put a lot of years of work in, 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 into it. And you have to come back from continually making mistakes and making the wrong decisions. And that way it's a really good practice for life because you will continually do the wrong things. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah patience for the fact that it's going to take it may take many years <laughs> um and i think that's that's hard for modern people who haven't grown up with horses as they were a kid to understand is that this is not we cannot shortcut this you know it is a serious discipline and it may take you a lot of years to really get competent even yes i love i love that message and i think it's so important and I was talking to um, Martin for a podcast recording last week and both he and I, um, we reflected that we have this tendency to, to force or to push or to, to drill, to really try and get from A to Z as quickly as possible. So I think that your reflection on needing to try again and again and have the strength to come mm. back again and again is really yeah. important for people to hear because it doesn't always go our way and it doesn't always go quickly. And, and often it yeah. feels like we really are taking that, that one step forward, two steps backwards. So, mm -hmm. and it can be, it can be really draining whether or not you are competitive, even just in a rehabilitation sense with my horse, I felt like that one step forward, two steps back. And um, it, it really drains you and it really impacts your mindset. So are you able to speak to us a little bit about some of the mindset shifts or changes that you've made throughout your journey yeah you know it's been interesting because i i have um yeah you're talking about people who are driven and in the industry it's people who are driven who get a lot of the attention and i can only say that i had uh, you know some of the people who i was a little wary of 20 and 30 years ago now unfortunately those people really have um you know after so many years in the industry of doing things the wrong way, that will eventually come around back to, to you. And too many of those people, I know too many people who are in jail. <laughs> I know too many people who are in jail, who have gone to jail, who have done really serious things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could see that tendency in them even back then, mm -hmm. you know, they would push and they just don't know stop. And having a lot of drive is good, but you have to know to stop also because you can't just keep, you can't just keep uh, going. One of the big mind shifts that I've had is that to, you, you know, if I have a strong feeling in myself of what it is I want to do, I can and I should definitely stick to that no matter what everybody else is doing. Because a lot of other people, they want you on board for their program. They want you on board for your for their plan. You will have a much better time. And now the internet is full of these people who've had their own special journey with horses and how they can write and tell, who are very happy that they stuck to what it is that they wanted to do. You know, and it was very hard because what they want to do is not flashy. Um, but having stuck to it, they are now very happy that they did, as opposed to trying to force themselves into some other mold. Either just competition or society or culture tries to put you, tries to make us all into nice little widgets that will work for someone else's cause. It is very hard to keep sticking to your own little inner voice. That's just saying, don't mind all those folks over there. Just keep 
doing your thing. Um, that's really hard to stick to. It can be hard to hear that voice amongst all of the noise. And it can be really hard to tell people who are much higher on the food chain, thank you very much. Yes, that's great. But I, I would like my little thing over here. And yes, I do like it <laughs> and have fun. Um, and that's really hard to do. And I wish I had, uh, even though I followed it, you know, I felt, it felt for a very long time like I was doing the wrong thing. Like I'm not doing what I should be doing. I'm not doing what you have to do to succeed. I'm not doing whatever the else should, should be doing. And the fact was I was doing what I should be doing, but there are a lot of messages that tell you not to do that. You know, that uh, don't, don't follow what it is that you want. Uh, follow what the other people want you to, um, to, to, to do. And I wish I, I wish I just had more confidence in that 30 years ago and not now. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, um, it's like a messaging that society gives us that the right, yeah. the right mm -hmm. thing to do is that you go the right. to university, yeah. right? And you, yes. you get your degree and then you use your degree and off you go. Yeah. And yeah. I really, that really resonates with me because I, I would have loved to remain in horses and have been a professional horse person my whole career, but I went to university and I did mm. a science degree and an engineering degree to start with. I didn't even know what engineering was when I signed up for the course. I had no idea. Oh. <laughs> cool. And, gotcha. And, you know, but society had told me that you obviously, you go into university and you get a degree and then you get a job and then you work that job nine to five. Yeah. It's really refreshing to hear from you who you managed to sort of break free from that mold but then also the, the, like the pressure that came with you or this feeling of, you just said, you know, you wish you had had that confidence to know that you're yes. doing the right thing. Do you think yeah. that's because society was telling you that you've, you've stepped out of this mold? Yeah, you stepped out of this mold. And, you know, I have friends who are dear to me who are still, uh, they're more than a little angry with me for not, you know, they have, done what they were supposed to do they have some very high paying jobs they work in medicine they do very important things and they did what they were supposed to do as opposed to what they wanted to do and they are more than a little pissed at those of us who don't do that in part because they work in medicine and you know i've like not in the united states you don't just you know, I've not had health insurance for 35 years, you know, <laughs> so, so they're like, you know, when you get hurt, we have to pay your bill. They have legitimate uh, critiques of my decisions for sure. And some of that is, uh, you know, hopefully those things are changing now and maybe we'll get universal health care in the United States one day, who, who, who knows. But, um, you know, some of those critiques are not, some of them are perfectly valid, you know, to do this very self-centered, self-serving thing. I don't want to do anything useful for society. I just want to go play with horses. <laughs> you know, I could be doing something reductive like collecting garbage or doing anything that was going to serve the greed, the, the greater good. So I'm not going to say that they don't have some valid points about things. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, to stick to doing your own, your own thing. I think that's very, 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 to stick to doing what you want to do. If you're lucky enough, I've been told by friends who don't have an overwhelming passion, how lucky I am to have something that really grips me that I really want to do, you know, that gets me out of bed every day that at the age of 51, I'm still willing to say, sign me up for that new course, buy me that new young four-year-old, get me that new job, you know, like I, there's still so much more that I could learn about this. And I'm still so, I still so want to do more. Um, I still am so interested in the phrase that I came up with, I don't know how many years ago was, I don't know what I can do with my horses, but I'm very curious to see what I can do. You know, I, I don't know what I can do, but I would very much like to find out and I'm, you know, willing to keep, to keep going. Um, and that, that was, I probably, I, maybe that was, maybe I came up with that when I had that conversation with my friend who was going to, to Europe. And she told me that, uh, she said that thing where um, if they told her she couldn't do it, she was going to stop. 
And I realized at that time, no, I don't know what I can do, but I would like to find out what I can do. I love that. It's, I think, very rare to find someone who has followed their passion and their, their, their actual calling throughout their life. It's, it's just incredible to hear about it. And I think in part, perhaps, maybe that helps you find satisfaction in the roles that you're in, if you can yeah. find them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, find, finding what I can get out of each job, you know, each discipline, I just got off of a job riding Icelandic ponies. I'm six foot one. So I wasn't when I took the job, it wasn't the plan that I was going to be riding the ponies, but having the mindset of, you know, I don't know much about this discipline or this sport or this thing. But I know there's going to be some very interesting, fascinating stuff within within it. You know, all horses are interesting. All the disciplines are interesting. They're all they're all really cool, and they all do kind of different. They all love horses, but they do different stuff. So um, I mean, I like to jump, but I like horses in general and I find in almost any discipline I can find something that's interesting or fascinating or that I like to learn the new thing about what it, whatever it is that they're um the, the, that, that they're doing yeah I love it if if someone's listening to this and they wish that they had that level of satisfaction or that kind of that mm -hmm. drive that you have to get up every mm -hmm. day and to keep learning and to keep training what advice would you offer them um yeah well the a lot of the i'm a podcast j junkie and i so i need to get that focused down more um but uh just to keep thinking about what it is that you want to set time you've got to set enough time every day to where you can you can think about um you know do I like this? Is this working for me? Am I working for these people? Sometimes I've had jobs where, despite the fact that my my intentions are good and their intentions are good, we don't have the same goals. <laughs> and it's not that I'm bad, and it's not that they're that, that they're bad, but we really don't want the same things, or the things that we want really don't work well together. And it's okay for you to then part ways, you know. It's not, you didn't do anything wrong. They didn't do anything wrong. You thought it was going to be, we were going to work out together and it just didn't. And it's totally fine to give yourself the space to be able to think about those things and to give yourself the space to say, this isn't working. I'm going to go do something else. Um, and that's, that can be hard to do when you're really busy at at the, at the barn. Uh, I like uh, meditating. I took it up, I don't know how many year, years ago, and it's one of the most useful things that I, that I, I do. Um, there's tons of books and podcasts and apps out, out, out of there. Um, yeah, but to do, do what you can do to hone your ability to think. Um, that's tricky. I know I've run into some people who say they try to meditate and they just can't do it. So for those folks, I don't know what, what, what to say. Um, but yeah, just to find some structure where you can evaluate what it is that you're doing, think think about it and give, give yourself permission to say either, yes, this is working or no, this is not. Yeah, I think that is fabulous, fabulous advice for everyone. And the other day I was, I'm also a podcast junkie. I was listening mm. to a podcast and they were saying that if you ask a child every five minutes what they want, they will have an answer for you. And it might, it might change, but they will always have an answer for you. If you ask yeah. most adults what they want out of life, most of them won't have an answer for you. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Very good. That is very good. We've really, really lost ourselves in our direction in that sense. So I really love this idea that you presented everyone that you need to actually take time to do that thinking and allow yourself the space to think about what you want. So um, I, I am one of those people that meditation, I struggle with it. I struggle with it. I know gotcha. lots of people listening find it um, useful and easy. So please do that. If anyone listening finds <laughs> me, what I do is um, I'm a calendar person. I'll show you. I've got this calendar on my desk every day and I know uh, what I'm doing at what time. And what I do is I, I block out time 
in my calendar. So maybe just half an hour on a Sunday evening and I just sit with myself and think about what I want, what my goals are, what I want to achieve. And I, and I find that really useful and it really centers me. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise I find I get carried away doing, but, but for what reason? Yes. Yeah. For what reason? Get carried away doing. Yes. Getting busy, being overly busy is an addiction. I've been told yeah. that we are addicted to being overly busy and having a look at all the things that I did. And uh, yes. Yes. Um, I think it's human doings rather than human beings. There you go. Yes. Human yes. doings. We're all about everything that, that we did. Yep. I, I agree. I love it. No, I think that's such a beautiful, beautiful takeaway. And I think it aligns perfectly with our topic because once you know or once you have a better sense of what you want then i think you mm -hmm. you are, you are clearer on what you accept in terms of ethics and standards and what you want and what you need in order to get that satisfaction so i think it all yep. really links beautifully back together awesome so for our audience and i know you just gave us a beautiful takeaway do you want to add anything else or do you think there's anything that we should mention before we wrap up today? That's a good question. Um, anything else to mention? Horses are awesome. People are awesome. Try to keep reminding yourself that when it gets hard. <laughs> I love that. Particularly the second part for me. <laughs> I always have to remind myself. <laughs> yes. So, so good. Well, Isabeau, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. And for everyone listening, where can they find you and follow you? And I know you're starting up a new business. So where can they go? Oh, yes, I am. I'm starting up. Uh, they can find me at straightupequine at gmail.com. I don't really have any content on yet. That's one of my projects I have to work on in the near future. But right now I'm offering people uh, remote coaching online by video. So they want to uh, hit me up at my Gmail address. I'd be happy to help help them out especially right now i'm studying straightness training which is uh an in-hand dressage method so that's that's my uh project for right now beautiful and i will make sure to put that link in the show notes and when we get the the social media or the website stood up i'll make sure i put that in there as well so they can find you awesome. forward and again thank Sounds you good. thank you so so much for joining me today thanks for having me it was super exciting i can't wait to see how it turns out Thank you so much for listening. My goal is to help you more effectively train or rehabilitate your horse by focusing on your mindset and management, both inside and outside of the arena. If this sounds like something you'd like one-on-one -on -one help with, or if you'd like to follow along for more, come join us on the Equestrian Mindset Academy Facebook or Instagram. The links will be in the show notes. Have a great week, everyone.